When people come together with a shared mission and a shared vision, but also have unique perspectives, that creates an incredible result. We had the honor of having our team in from different parts of the world. Everybody came specifically to film this flagship course around silence your inner critic. I really don't know anyone that hasn't had some kind of inner critic. The beauty of having Robert and Rosie is that they came at it from different aspects as well. But that creates this wonderful moment of, oh, I never looked at it that way. It's really about how you move from the inner critic to your inner champion. Even though I wrote the book on it, I was like, whoa, that's amazing because we all share different insights. Having a difference in perspective is paramount to making an impact. Hey, Heart Leader community, this is Amber Mikesell, and I am so excited. Silence Your Inner Critic has a release date. We'll be hitting shelves March of 2025, and you have an opportunity to get on the wait list by clicking the link below. And when you do, you're going to immediately get a gift from me. It is the Silence Your Inner Critic Starter Kit, where you'll get 13 tips to get started on silencing your inner critic before the book hits the shelves. Last week, we had the honor of having our team in from different parts of the world. Dr. Rosie Kuhn came in from Orcas Island up in Washington, and we had Robert Duran, or Doran as I call him, um, who came in from the UK. And everybody came specifically to film this flagship course around silence your inner critic. I want to talk about what we discovered as a team as we navigated that course, things that I personally, even though I wrote the book on it, I was like, whoa, that's amazing because we all shared different insights. And then really what the course is even about, if you're willing to dive into such things with me. Absolutely. Um, yeah, I mean, let's start first and foremost with, uh, to me, is kind of like how we actually started right when they came in, right? And that was talking about how it's really important, this is Sweet Air as a whole, but also within this course, that when people come together with a shared mission and a shared vision, but also have unique perspectives, that creates an incredible result. That creates impact and creates movement that creates growth but it also pulls your inner critic very forward <laughs> <laughs> just gotta say yes yeah so with that kind of at heart and top of mind uh we decided to kind of create this endeavor of a flagship course focusing on eight different aspects on where the inner critic really starts to lean in <laughs> and take over let's just say and so, you know, for, for anyone listening, this is, this is just the start. We all know that there are far more than eight places and eight areas in which the inner critic shows up. Um, but this is kind of like these, these, this is a core and we need to have a good place to start. Yes. And with each of us being able to take two segments, it gave us an opportunity in our specific segment to really dive deep into what role the inner critic plays in those areas. And, you know, of course, you and I, we come at it from this superhero, supervillain kind of approach and all of our fun aspects that go along with that. But the beauty of having Robert and Rosie is that they came at it from different aspects as well, what their specialty is and how they dive into it. And as you said, that creates this wonderful moment of, oh, I never really looked at it that way. But we get the chance then to say, how is my inner critic showing up in that reflection of seeing what we've created done differently by other individuals, even though it's exactly what we want, right? It is exactly what we want is everyone to take the material and adopt it to their way of being, their way of implementing it into their life. But there's the, I know this part of it. And then there's the, this is what I feel as a result part of it. Fortunately, I didn't get triggered or there wasn't anything overwhelming, 
But that doesn't mean that there weren't moments where I didn't say, why didn't I think of that? And well, that's so good. Like, why, why am I that imposter syndrome that the inner critic loves to feed on, right? And I know from mentors and people who have done very amazing things in this world, everyone goes through moments of feeling imposter syndrome. It keeps you in check. But when the inner critic gets a hold of that imposter syndrome and then wants to like shove you back into the box, there are specific tools and things that we can use to help pull us out of that again. And I found myself using my own tools and techniques, right, in order to balance things out. Yeah, absolutely. And maybe it might be good to just kind of walk through the eight different areas that we're focusing on yeah. uh, and and kind of who's doing what. So we can kind of start from there and then share a little bit about some of the tools that people will actually find in there. But just know that this is just kind of high level, that we're going to really be doing an in-depth dive in this flagship course. Like this is an expanded curriculum uh, and it's really about how you move from the inner critic to your inner champion. Yes. So I can talk about my two right out of the gate, which is spirituality and religion and how the inner critic really gets in there and can do its best to make us feel unworthy of love, of direct connection with whatever our perspective of God or source is, and how it can even begin to break down relationships if you do begin to expand beyond your current belief and your desire for exploration and growth as a being. You know, that inner critic wants to get in there and say, well, you're betraying your tradition or how dare you go beyond. You are not as good as creation itself. Who are you to begin to explore that? So what can we do in order to begin to navigate all the things that could come up as we start to explore and embrace not only our own belief system, but the belief systems of others that we will come into contact with, right? Then I have relationships, which to me flowed very asynchronously into religion and spirituality because the partner I had that allowed space for me to meet you and to have this beautiful connection that we have now, that individual was very, very devout in their belief system. At the moment, I started to explore all world religions and all world beliefs more in depth and held love as my religion or my faith. And when that relationship started to break down and I was being told that I was wrong for my beliefs or that there were things that were going on that my partner, my person said, I can't stand by you through this. Then I had to look at my relationships and how I'm showing up in relationships And how the inner critic started playing a key role, even in my spiritual beliefs, into my relationships. Do I change my beliefs in order to make my partner happy? Do I, am I really wrong for what I'm believing, feeling, exploring? And why is it wrong to desire to explore things? You know, it kept driving me forward. So there's that overlap between spirituality, religion, and relationships, because sometimes we can create codependent relationships based on our beliefs. Absolutely. Yeah. Or, um, yeah, I mean, just with how foundational believing or nowadays even not believing in things, many people, whatever it is that they believe, so I guess not believing is still believing in something. Yeah, it's a belief. It's still a belief, right? Yeah. Um, but a lot of people are viewing it more as or taking it on as an identity. 
right? And and that's part of what I believe you do such a great job expressing and explaining to people, like, you know, in terms of, and we've done this on the podcast, explaining how, you know, our ideas or our thoughts, perspectives, beliefs, they aren't our identity. Even our actions. Even our actions, right? They're not our identity. We have the opportunity to, uh, you know, transcend that. And, but it is an opportunity for us to experience and explore and hopefully play and, and enjoy, right? I mean, that's, that's, we, we need to have a framework in which to engage in life. And so these beliefs, thoughts, ideas, perspectives are great ways to do that. But if they, if we take them on as our identity and it becomes a, you know, a part of our ego, for example, and then someone thinks differently, then immediately it's a, it's a right, wrong scenario. It's a, you know, opposites, uh, you know, it's no longer a spectrum. It's a, it's a dualistic approach. Right. And speaking back to what I navigated, right. There was a perspective because of a belief system that I needed to be saved from myself versus a desire to understand, well, why is this coming up for you now? What can we do together so that I'm honoring myself? You're honoring yourself, but we're also honoring the relationship but the moment that inner critic gets in there from the ego standpoint which you're you're so beautifully saying then it becomes that i'm right you're wrong you must become a mini version of my own belief system or the relationship can't go any further and that's ego and ego is the best friend to your inner critic They've formed this little posse together that really holds tight on our abilities to expand our own internal awareness or our own internal landscape, because keeping you in the box will absolutely continue to give them control. Yeah, right. And when love is less important than what whatever it is looks like, that might be a great opportunity to take a step back and say, is what I believe in actually rooted in what it's meant to be. Yes. And that can be a faith, that can be politics, that can be um, culture. I mean, there's so much that goes in, but um, you know, we've been we've been watching some you know fun shows when we, we need our time to, <laughs> to reset. Time, yeah. Um and um but it's been amazing. I've been kind of seeing this continued flow of where someone might need to uh, adjust themselves to match the other person in a situation that if they don't, then they won't be able to be together. And that's kind of interesting to me because if our main goal and the main goal, a lot of these religions and, and, and when you kind of really break it down, people just want to be loved, right? Love, they want to be love, seen, love. heard and gotten, and they want to be loved. Yes. Right. But then we overcomplicate it by creating all these other aspects in it and saying, oh, well, no, it has to look this way. And if it doesn't, then we can't be together. Well, then it's deprioritizing love, the very core, the very essence. And if we're deprioritizing love, then what are we doing? Yes, 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 yes. And I feel that that's what has helped you and I build this amazing bond that we have. Because love has always been the center focus and giving and receiving that love because out of love comes compassion, comes play, comes the deep rooted desire to be there for one another while also being there for yourself. And there are never like those, yes, we have our own personal boundaries, But there are never lines drawn so strongly that I have to tell you, this is my boundary. If you cross it, then we really need to have a deep, deep discussion about where we go to in the future. Never an ultimatum, but even with boundaries, we've when it comes from love, you never desire to overstep my boundary in that way because you love me. And if you have something going on that's bumping up against my boundary, then we sit and we talk about it because maybe my boundary was based on something prior to you. Sure. And oftentimes boundaries are 
based on not fully formed ideas. And so having your partner that you can trust and feel safe in and have that discussion and have realizations. I mean, how many times have you and I shared our boundaries and realized, oh yeah, we actually, we actually have the same, we might be saying it differently, but then the reality is that it's a lot of the same stuff and anything that I'm putting in or you're putting in is a, is an, is a not fully formed idea around that boundary because it's tainted by some experience like you just said in the past or something like that or a fear of what could happen in the future but isn't actually happening now and so both of those situations are keeping us from the connected present and the love and the love and so when we can remove ourselves from that and we can be in the connected present and prioritize the love well then all these ideas and perspectives and beliefs uh become an, an aspect of who we are, not the identity of who we are. We can breathe that love that we have deep, deep, deep from ourselves, from our soul into our beliefs, into our perspectives and into our ideas, and then share them together. Yes. And when we do that, it becomes an expansion of ourself instead of a constriction yes. into what we can do. Yes. And that's why for me, being able to talk about spirituality, religion, and relationships was such a fluid flow because those are both, I mean, it's all a way for us to understand and expand our own awareness through experience. But for me, those areas, that inner critic can get in there and make you feel so small or judge you for every action. Like, oh my gosh, I hurt my partner. Why am I so bad? Shame on me versus you might not even be hurt. You might simply be expressing what you're feeling, but because my inner critic has me feeling so self-conscious and so disconnected from our actual relationship, that's where I spiral. Now, thankfully, I don't do that anymore. But that doesn't mean I didn't used to do it in the past. And I understand that connection. So I'm really grateful to be able to talk about that. But you had two that were really big too and that we both have navigated through. Right. And before we before I dive into that, I just qu quickly want to express that the four of us chose these areas because of personal experience. Mm -hmm. you know, in terms of you with uh, spirituality slash religion and then relationships, you know, as, as the lead minister and co-founder of Suivera, an organization, you know, to the growth that we've had with Suivera as a religious organization, uh, you know, now 1.2 million members in 113 countries in just four years, you know, there's an understanding, plus your deep study in the past of world religions, world cultures, and your experience in relationships. Um, and so there's, there's a lot that you're coming from, both from an academia standpoint, but also from just a personal life experience. And that was so critical to us making these choices. It wasn't just like, Hey, let's pick out a hat and see what happens. <laughs> <You> <laughs> it's <know>? very random. <laughs> no, it's very intentional, which is what we do here at Svivera and the Heart Leader podcast and anything that you and I focus on. Um, Except for sometimes for dinner, <laughs> maybe we're not yeah. be so intentional. Not so focused, that happens, yeah. But that leads into what you're talking about, right? And why it is important to be intentional, even in that. Um, yeah, and and so the two areas that I focused on are um, body image and health and well-being, and these have been really core areas for me uh, in the last, well, for most of my life, but intentionally speaking, for the last 15 years. Uh, it's really been uh, a huge awakening in so many ways, uh, starting from an injury that I had in college, which was really debilitating. Um, I had a herniated disc explosion in my neck, my back, three cracked ribs, ribs and vertigo, and psoas, all from playing D1 golf. Uh, and that was my goal. I wanted to be a professional golfer, and this, completely, this injury completely derailed me. And it was stemming from... Um, issues where I struggled in body image. It was stemming from uh, issues ar around a misunderstanding around health and well-being, thinking that both of those were simply surface level and not a, a, a deeper dive into the correlation that they have, which is not just body, but also, you know, what is my mental mind frame? 
you know, am I positive? Is it a positive? Is it negative? Am I leaning into that negative brain bias or am I bringing in affirmations that can really support me? You know, is it, where was my, uh, emotional awareness? You know, my emotional management, how, I mean, how many emotions was I swinging through and moving through or suppressing and not even allowing myself to feel right. And then finally, spiritually, much in the long lines of what you just talked about, and we don't often correlate our you know we we hear my body is a temple Mm -hmm. but how often are we actually practicing that and how are we diving into aligning it uh with the relationship with ourself and the relationship with what we believe in and tying it all together and so with me this is um, a massive amount of experience um, I do have some background in, in having different certifications and meditation and nutrition and aspects like that. Um, I, I am not a doctor. I did not get medical school practice in this sense, um, but I've had a lot of injuries being uh, in sports my whole life. And um, I've done a lot of therapy. I've, I've learned a lot. I've done a lot of uh, transformational coaching, you know, in, in, in personal growth. Uh, so I'll be sharing a lot of my stories, what I went through, what I experienced, how much I've grown um, from from the injury to reshaping my life into something, you know, becoming everything that I didn't want to be, even though I thought that's what the world was telling me and what I should be, and then having basically a, a, a quarter life crisis slash breakdown slash epiphany. At 25. <laughs> Funny how those are all kind of together, right? It's whatever <laughs> whatever it needs to be to get your attention. Exactly. All at once at 25, you know, and, uh, and then the last 10 years from there where that's taken me. You know, if you would have said a little over a decade ago that I'd be a you know, co-founder of a, of a major religious organization in the world, I would have thought you were kind of crazy. Um, you know? And I am. Yeah. <laughs> but that's okay. <laughs> yeah, we all are. Um, but that's... So anyways, that's where my experience is coming from in this. And uh, and it'll be fun to kind of share these different perspectives and ideas um, as as it's really body image and health and wellness, well-being have really permeated my very existence over the last 15 years. And just the ebbs and flows of what that's meant and the perspectives I've had, uh, especially coming from um, you know, a non-spiritual experience to a very... Uh, very spiritual experience. So, you know, just like anything, I'm not going to be here to tell people what to do or how to do it, but just to share. And, uh, yeah. Yeah. And what I really appreciated when I listened to you as you were filming your course is that you were willing to share what you went through and what you still navigate through. Because I know sometimes my inner critic will will pop up in there if I'm listening to someone who's showing me a new way of doing something. And it, of course, it will go, well, how do you know? And why, why listen to them? So internally, my, my whole process is like, why listen to them? What are they bringing to the table that you don't already have? which is such an ego center, like that's the ego and the inner critic both teaming up together to be like, don't receive new information. Are you kidding? That might turn us around and put us in a position where we're not the ones leading you. And so to proactively open myself to listening to you in a different way than, you know, like specifically as my partner in all things in life, But now to listen to you as a teacher and a guide based on what you navigated and what you're still navigating, it was amazing to be able to to do that. And your in-depth personal experience, I feel, is going to resonate with so many people because we all have little things in our body image or even our health and well-being where we start to go down in a negative spiral and that negative brain bias you're talking about, right? And when you feel that another has done that and then come back from it, it's like, oh, that means I can do it. And knowing that you still consistently pull yourself 
back up out of it. Even though when I look at you, you look like the epitome of health and you are so fit and so handsome. Of course, I'm a little biased, but it's true. And anyone who meets you feels that presence. But that doesn't mean your inner critic isn't still in there working overtime to pull you back into being small. Yeah, that's really well said. Yeah, I mean, I don't, I genuinely don't know anyone who, I haven't met every person in the world. So a little caveat, um, but I really don't know anyone that hasn't had some kind of body image inner critic or some kind of health and well-being inner critic. So this is one that just, I mean, not everyone's going to relate to the exact story that I've had, but I feel like they'll be able to pull something from it uh, because I'll be touching on a lot of things that I feel like a lot of us have struggled from and with. And so when it comes to being, even if it's feeling, being overweight or feeling overweight or feeling tired or exhausted or overworked or stressed or having anxiety or fear or, um, you know, being stuck. I mean, I feel like all of us have, I know I've experienced a ton of that and, and I still do. It's like a smorgasbord that you can just pick off of today. I'm going to take this one and this one and this one. (laughs) Exactly. And so being able to kind of just talk openly and first off, let people know like, Hey, you're not alone. There's, there's a lot, like we're all here, here I am and here you are, we're, we're offering this flagship course and we're struggling with it, but it's not, it's called silence your inner critic for a reason, not shut up your inner critic or kill your inner critic or if your inner critic doesn't exist. You know, these, these are false narratives in my, in my opinion. And so silencing your inner critic is all about learning how to, when to listen and when not to. Right. Because sometimes that inner critic, and we've talked about this, can be a huge benefit. It can really help. It can grow and it can say, it can point out the areas for our personal growth. So we're not like, oh, I've just, I've, I know everything. I've got it all. Yeah. I got this. Yeah. An inner critic is good. It needs to permeate a little bit in that sense just to keep us grounded, humbled, and, and, <laughs> and authentic. But like any good supervillain, right? <laughs> yes. Exactly. <laughs> But at the same time, you know, when it when it starts to take over and direct our actions, you know, control our thoughts in that sense, that's when it's important to learn how to effectively silence it. And so going through stories and experiences and sharing like we are in these different ways, you know, that's can let people know it's one, it's possible. Uh, and two, you know, it's it's not insurmountable. Yeah. Even when it feels like it is because there's been a huge block placed by that supervillain, right? You can always find a way to break through it. And I think that is so important to keep at heart because sometimes it does feel insurmountable. Like it is, how am I going to navigate through this? But that's where having communities that you can discuss things with having tools and resources that help you immediately go, oh, I know a tool that can help me in this area. It's like having Captain America's shield, right? You know when to use it and when to set it down and go at something in a different way. And that's really the practice. Well said. And yeah, I mean, the inner critic really tends to show up when we feel alone. Yeah. Because we are very naturally social creatures, right? We we desire to be around other people. And when we feel ostracized or alone, um, you know, it's it can that's when it really feels daunting and overwhelming. And and so yeah, the the whole concept of this is really not just to provide practical tools and and a pers- new perspectives around awareness and expand that growth in that way. But it's also to provide a community, yes. right? To know that you're not alone, that you are seen, heard, and gotten. There are people who want to see you, hear you, and get you. And that this world is a better place because of each and every one of us sharing a different perspective. Again, back to the beginning of this conversation, if we all have a similar mission and vision, Having a difference in perspective is paramount to making an impact. 
And so when we do have that shared mission and vision and we can see something from a different perspective, well, that's what allows limitless possibilities to occur. If we are all the same perspective, then that's where limitations creep in. Back to your Baskin Robbins from a previous podcast, you know, sampling. We as beings get to sample a whole bunch of different ways that we show up in any given situation, but we also get to sample how others show up in a given situation. And every one of those, even if we don't align with it, even if we get to a point where we say, you know what, I really appreciate you bringing me to a point where I had to decide how I'm showing up in this situation. That's soul growth. That's movement forward. And bringing love back into the center or the focus, what a loving act by someone to bring you to a point where you can understand who you are in this moment and how you're showing up. And that's not easy. And part of the reason we have this silent or inner critic book coming out with our our church or our organization, Sui Vera, is because it is that inner critic that gets in your head and in your ear so much that it separates you from all the different areas that we're talking about under our creed, which is what we stand for as an organization. So you talk about your body being your temple. Well, that's one of our creed items, right? To have the agree that there's a potential that your body is more than just what you're using to move through this world with, right? It is the house for your soul. And as such, you can learn from it. So there's a potential there for you to learn from your own body. If you get the awareness and you get away from your ego and your inner critic, kind of belittling your body, right? And I feel like Rosie, Dr. Rosie Kuhn, also did a great job of talking about that around aging. Yeah, absolutely she did. And this is something, you know, I hear 20-year-olds talking about at this point, that there is such a fear around aging, not only from the way that you feel when you age, but the way that you look. And when you allow that inner voice in your head to start picking out every little gray hair that you might get as you age or every little wrinkle, what does that do to your self-esteem, your well-being, your body image? It starts to really break it down and then you look outward and you're like, but that person doesn't look that way or that person. So then you start the comparison trap, right? Which can take you down. So Rosie talks about a lot of different ways that aging shows up and the inner critic just goes, I'll take that and uses it as a weapon against you instead of you being able to look at it. I always say that aging isn't a punishment. It's a privilege. Not everyone gets that privilege. And so how can you flip that script and start to look at it that way? And she brings tons of great tools to the mix from that. I agree. I agree. And that's such a good point. It is a privilege. No one is guaranteed any more life than anyone else. You know, and that's that's something we kind of forget. We look into the future and we're like, maybe we regret. Or, or not regret, we are fearful of aging, but we're not guaranteed any, any more of the next second than someone else. And so I think we almost take aging for granted in that sense. And, and we look at it from a fear standpoint, instead of being grateful, like, wow, you know, if you do get to that age, well, first off, how many people ever did, you know, and throughout human history, not a lot of people have gotten you know, into, you know, 80s, 90s, 100s. I mean, now, especially with where medicine is going, it could be a lot lot more normal for people to, to live longer than 100 years old. You know, that's that's a relatively new thing. And so, you know, that's there's so much excitement. And I mean, look at what's happened to our world in the last 100 years. 
I mean, if you were born in in the 1920s and you're about 100 right now, you've seen a lot of change. That's exciting. I mean, you know, I've been on this planet for 35 years and I feel like I've seen a lot of change. And so I can't wait to see, you know, what the next 60, 70 plus years are going to look like because it's like, wow, this is, I'm, I'm excited just what's happened in the last three years. <laughs> like, yeah. you know, our world is, we're living like this whole thing. It's like, it's almost like what we thought in, we're in sci-fi movies. Yeah. It's like, we're starting to live it. And that's crazy. We're in the Jetsons. Right? Yes. <laughs> we it's really exciting. are. It's very exciting. So, you know, there, there is, there's so much love and excitement and joy and play and fun that can be had by, you know, like you said, it's not a punishment. I think that's such a great perspective to, to view this from. And, you know, it's important to start thinking about things from a philosophical standpoint and, and recognize that in some ways aging is, is a, is our choice too and how, right. And so I think that's another area that, you know, without giving away too much of what Rosie dives into, um, of what she really focuses on and giving people the, the right tools, um, perspectives, ideas, uh, to, to support, uh, aging from a space of longevity, uh, which is ultimately from a pl- that idea that, that core longevity stems from a greater energy, I feel, which is abundance. And that is actually her other topic. Yeah. And how she came at it, I feel greatly interweaved because abundance, often when we say, are you abundant? The inner critic and your inner dialogue is going to immediately take you to, am I financially sound? Yeah. Right. And her point through this is, you know, finances is one small aspect of abundance. So how are you focused on all of the other ways that your life is abundant? And are you directing yourself in the ways that matter most to you? Like No discrimination, whatever you desire to be abundant in, are you mindfully navigating toward that abundance? And one thing I love that you always say is you're always abundant in something. If you're abundant in lack, it's because that's where your focus has been. Like you feel lack in everything, not just money, but connection and relationship values. Like all of it begins to feel like you're lacking in life. But if you are abundant in a grateful mindset, in mindfulness, If you are abundant in the love that you give and receive in relationships, then and out into the world, then you have abundance. It doesn't have to just be about finances, though limited finances can cause you to limit your view and everything else. And that's where the inner critic goes, oh, okay, you feel limited in this area. Let me take that and hold on to it. And then invoke that negative brain bias and make you feel like you are lacking in everything. And then your self-worth goes down, your body image goes down. Like it's all so interconnected. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it is. You're so right. I mean, that we are always, we are always abundant. And so, yes, that where you, where, where you, where you, we say we're paying attention to something. We're literally, it's almost like buying that moment, right? With your time. Right. And so, so where is the intention? What are you pay, what are you paying attention to? So if yeah, if you're in lack, then you're gonna be abundantly in lack. If you're in love, and not like in love, like romantically, but like in an energy of of that is very loving energy, um, then you're gonna be abundantly in a loving energy. And so abundance is gratitude uh, let's go back to like a podcast that we've done in the past and talked about a bunch where uh, gratitude is a key to unlock abundance because you can't give what you don't already have and so when you're grateful for what you have it expands your ability to give and it becomes this beautiful cycle and so talk about abundance like that is abundance and you can so if you're ever lost or you feel like you're outside of of an abundant you're like, oh, I can't tap into this energy that's just there. And I know that I'm getting in my own way. 
That's step one. Step two is then invoking more gratitude into your life and then breathing that into the rest of everything else, like finances, like romantic relationships, like friendships or whatever, you know, work, uh, productivity. I mean, any of it could be abundant. And so that's the beauty of it. It's, it's really our, our limitations are what, are what is placed on gratitude, on abundance, not the other way around. Exactly. And that's why I know Ken Honda, I'm going to give him a big old shout out. He wrote a book called Happy Money. And there's so much contained in that book around where your focus goes, even your finances will flow, right? And so how do you create happy money? I highly recommend the book. Love Ken Honda. Love his book. Um, but Rosie covers some a good bit of this within her course around tools and techniques you can use to pull back that inner critic, which may be helping you understand, like, this is what I feel right now. But it doesn't take you to the next level of, okay, so what are you going to do about it? And then we flow into Robert's um, phenomenal courses. He took on something that to me is a very challenging topic to take on, but he went headfirst into it because he's been there and he's walked the path. And that's the inner critic's role in addiction, right? And he was so transparent in what he's navigated and how the inner critic played a role in his addiction and in his recovery, right? How he moved through that in tools that worked specifically for him in that journey, which I knew not from an inner critic standpoint, but from a self-awareness standpoint, which I think is a key differentiator too, is I couldn't talk about this in a way that may connect to someone who's going on that journey or finds themselves there right now because I haven't gone through an addiction and recovery. But that's why we so focus on the difference between guide and teacher in our organization. Both are so important, but teachers don't always... Like I could teach on the subject, everything I've learned about addiction and recovery, I could teach that. But that's not the same as someone who's walked the path, someone who knows the experiences, the highs, the lows, the in-betweens, and has acquired the tools that help them along the way. Because now they're speaking from that place of experience, that place of knowing, and that creates that love connection, that relationship aspect of, I know what you're going through at least to some level because I've been there. And I thought he did such a wonderful job yeah. of doing that. He made it very approachable, which is really nice. And I think he also set it up in a, in a beautiful way where like you and I both have not had, uh, had not had an addiction. So we, yeah, we can't speak to that. And that was really important for us and grateful that Robert was willing to step up and share in that way. Um, but also, I think for, for those who haven't been in the same boat as us and haven't had an addiction, but may know someone, whether it's a family member or a close friend, we all, we all are touched by it in some way. And so to be able to see a different perspective, um, because not everyone who's gone through an addiction is, has the best ability to express it or understand it um, or share where they're at, uh, it's really tough. I mean, it's tough to do that on any subject, let alone uh, something that they might not even understand. Yes. And so I, th I think him being able to uh, position it in a way for people like myself, who's able to see it from a different lens and have a greater sense of compassion and empathy. Not that I was seeking that I lacked it, but we don't know until we know. And when I got to understand it at the depth of level, then I'm able to rise up to that level of empathy. And so it expanded my awareness. And so I was able to raise my, my level of compassion, empathy in that area and see it from, from a greater capacity. And so I think that was super helpful. And so, uh, you know, cause I, I, that was one of my questions as we were going through this, like, well, is, I mean, I see addiction as a really big thing, but it's not, is it something that everyone 
goes through? And, and the answer is no. But it's imperative and important that this is a part of it. And, I, and I'm so glad it is because everyone knows someone. Mm -hmm. It is prolific enough in, in our society in that sense where everyone at least knows someone. And so to be able to have a part of this that can that you can watch it, you know, to help you, like maybe you do have an addiction and you're not even aware of it. Mm -hmm. And so to be able to to explore this this class and this module uh, and expand on that, or if you don't, then say, hey, this is going to help me better understand, you know, my brother, my sister, my mom, my dad, my cousin, you know, my family member, my person at work, you know, any of that at a at a better at a greater level, and to be like, wow, I can be a better friend or I can be, you know, I can help them out or, Hey, I can even share this with them to support them. Even if there's, I don't know if there's anything else I can do. You know, that's, that's a great space. I'm super grateful that, that Robert expressed it in that capacity. Yeah, I agree. And his vulnerability was paramount, which again, I haven't, I have been with someone who had an addiction or has. It's not something necessarily you have to keep it front of mind. And I do know that once you recognize that you have one. And so vulnerability from the person who's navigating it is so, so important. And the willingness to say where you are when you're there and not let the inner critic shut you down and shut your voice down because others are going to think poorly of you for having an addiction. That's a very vicious spiral. And seeing Robert just say, look, this is where I'm at even now. And this is where I was. But as you said at the beginning of this, it did not define me. It does not say who I am. It just shows me what I've navigated and what choices I have to make in order to choose something differently every time. And that was such a beautiful thing to be in witness of. Because whether you have an addiction or not, it is very easy to cut down vulnerability. Like that's one of the first things that inner critic goes in there and just like loves to cut away and put into a box is your willingness to be vulnerable and transparent with people because you don't desire to appear weak, right? Where what Robert demonstrated is vulnerability is a superpower. And the moment you begin to embrace that superpower, then you do begin to see things differently. And I feel like he did the same in his other topic area, which is creativity. Yeah. Being able to see things differently is a creative practice. Yes. Yeah. And to get out of your own way. And so he did a wonderful job of blending like what can addiction do to your creativity? But even if you don't have an addiction, how does limiting your creativity interweave into everything else, right? From the way that you experience your life to the way you experience your job, there are all these ways that creativity comes into play that we don't even necessarily acknowledge. Right. Yeah. And he also touches on like purpose and intention and how creativity stems from the heart, not the head. Even when you think creatively, there's still this connection to the heart and why it's so important to be aware. And so when we activate our heart, we are inherently activating our creativity and that can be expressed in so many beautiful ways. And so, yeah, his, as a creative being himself, uh, specifically in the arts, I think he does a great job saying, Hey, it's not just if you're artistic, you know, musically or, you know, drawing, painting, et cetera. It's like, Hey, you can, you can breathe, this type of creativity into, into business, into philosophy, into sports. I mean, there's so many things you can do. So uh, it was nice to, nice to see him round it out and expand. It's you know, sometimes creativity itself gets put in a box. So, you know, to creatively think outside of it and show what's, <laughs> you know, what's possible. Creatively be creative. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, it was a, it's a, it's a beautiful course. Yes. 
And so that's the eight. Those are the eight total aspects that we have in this first run of our flagship course around Silence Your Inner Critic, which is based on the book. But bringing in Rosie and Robert takes it beyond the book and into guides and teachers coming forward and saying, but this is how the inner critic played a part for me. So you don't just get my aspect or your aspect. You're getting to see others and how they're utilizing tools from the book, but also their own tools to say, this is how I blend it together. Yeah. Right. Yeah, absolutely. And ex we talked about experience is really key here. Um, that's what we really desire to be. Um, a core aspect of all of this is, is all of us having some kind of experience in some way and sharing from that. Um, and that's what we desire from the community and the connection is to show, you know, not one of us has all the answers and all the experience, but collectively we do. And so that's when we can lean in on that and we all know that we're stronger together. So, you know, let's, let's really lean in on that and make it, you know, make it an impact and show that we're not alone and that we are, we are here to support each other. That's a beautiful thing. Yeah. And we're seeing that on our Facebook page through Suivera and how individuals are supporting one another, helping each other through challenging or painful times. We're seeing it through my new life launch pad, which will open up here to everyone soon. My New Life Launchpad is a, a community, like our flagship community, right, where individuals, we do something every week to help individuals, and then they can take that and work with each other to say, oh, well, this fit for me as is, or I morphed it this way, and this is what I'm going through in my life. So there are so many communities that we're creating in order to support each other and whatever it is that we're navigating through, right? But that inner critic for me was such an entry point, recognizing that if I'm not my actions and I'm not my feelings and I'm not my emotions, at least the ones I'm navigating right now, then I'm also not that inner critic, that negative voice that keeps flowing in my head. So how can I pull that out from inside of me and look at it objectively? And since fun and flair is always important for us, like that's the reason in the book it is called your super villain because it will always challenge you. It will always do its best to trap you because that's what it does. That's the negative brain bias cycle that we have. But that doesn't mean that I can't rise up and say, uh, no, because I'm not you. You're not me. You might be along for the ride in this journey, but I'm still going to drive. Mm -hmm. Right. And so get in the back. <laughs> We're done having this conversation. And if it doesn't listen, then what can I do? I can't threaten it. It's going to laugh at me and use that threat. So what can I proactively do that isn't that, that helps me move through it? Yes. Inner champion, take the wheel. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Well, do you want to kind of share with everyone when the course will be available and, uh, and how they'll be able to get access to it? I would love to. So if you are struggling at all with your inner critic, and this has resonated with you. We will be launching the book, Silence Your Inner Critic, on March 4th. And this course will be part of that bundle, that opportunity. It may get released a little bit before, but we really want to make certain that you have both resources to tie together in order to navigate that hero's journey, becoming your own superhero and allowing your inner champion to rise so that that supervillain can get in the back seat. So if you take a moment, you can head over now to silenceyourinnercritic.com. 
you can join the wait list for the book. And the moment you join that wait list, you're going to start getting a plethora of resources that you can add to your superhero arsenal to go in and really look at your inner critic in depth. And then you'll have constant follow-ups from us around tools and techniques, including this class and when it will be launched just from signing up for the wait list for the book. So I look forward to seeing your name come into my inbox as someone who has joined the wait list and getting all of these fun little tools out to you as your gal in the chair, the one that's going to empower that superhero. We're going to make certain that you get all the cool technique all the cool technical aspects and gadgets and fun to add to your armory well in advance. If you're looking for other things to do right now, we also have a whole segment on Silent Your Inner Critic out here on our podcasts. As we were creating the book, we always wanted to hear from you. So we did the outline of the book in a podcast format and then gathered information to help frame the book. So head on over there and look at one of those episodes to keep you engaged in this journey. 